This is the Barracuda Legend circuit board. This detector works on a pulse induction balance principle, I think. I say that because I have no technical help on this particular board and I'm not an expert, so if something goes wrong, I don't know how to fix it. However, I have been shown how to put them together and everything I know about this particular circuit will be in this video. So if you follow the video carefully, you will have a very decent beach and land detector which would be quite expensive to buy off the shelf and with very decent performance to boot. I have tried this particular detector in the gold fields area and found that it does not balance anywhere near fast enough to compensate for the massive ground changes which is very common in gold field areas but in salt, sand, mud, water or on normal land conditions it is truly a great little unit and perfect for what it was designed for and you can use my gold finder XTR mono search coil I have designed for the loop here because it uses a very similar power output. The only small drawback which is typical for all advanced pulse induction detectors is that it is quite sensitive to small pieces of metal. It is also quite heavy on the battery drain and it does not have a discriminator which is usually useless anyway. But if you want flawless performance the trade-off is well worth it. Remember the people who design and work on these boards are the elite and the pulse induction is the latest successful detector design which was originally credited to Eric Foster in England. So if you have any questions about the circuit ask a tech expert not me. Alright that's what the board looks like back front you get a bag of parts simply open a bag up and spread all the parts out on the paper excuse the mess but you'll see why it's so messy later on after you've taken them out of the bag you straighten out all the DIN sockets the sockets where the chips go into straighten out the legs make sure they're in the right way as you can see there's a little notch at the end there tells you which way to put them line up all the legs it's a lot easier said than done and put them in the hole seat them in just like that now that they're all in place just flip it over turn your soldering iron on doesn't matter how hot you put the soldering iron because they're protected from the DIN socket now make sure your tip of your soldering iron is absolutely spotlessly clean it's hot enough tint the tip now I've wiped that on a damp sponge to make sure that there's no contamination on it and seek out and sold it that's going to take a little while to heat up and it doesn't matter that it takes a bit longer because they protect the chips are protected from the from the heat with the socket. That's going to hold that in place now. All right. Do not join them up. Join them up. You're going to be using a solder sucker. Get this solder off. Whatever you do, don't join these two holes or any other two that might be in the same line like that. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to get the other part in. Now you've soldered them all in, just check it, make sure you haven't joined up any of the holes that you shouldn't. Turn it around, 
Now, just simply put the ICs in. They'll just slot straight in the right way around. A little notch. Goes out the front. As you can see, there's a notch on the chip as well as on the board. Do that with all the ICs. All right, just use a little bit of alcohol. It's got this methylated spirits. Dab a little bit on and just rub the board down get all that flux off tends to interfere with the circuit now probably the best thing to do now is gather up all these little pieces here sort them all out from the rest okay here comes the confusing part IK63 and you want five of those see I've got five IK63 or 100N okay now you've got five of these now these are 4N7 100 4N7 100 five off now you've got one of these which is a 1N J100 1N J100 1N now you've got three of these 0.4 J63 J63 or 470N now this one's all on its own that goes in a very special spot on the board that's a 6 in 8 now that 6 in 8 we have a look at the board goes right down there as you can see the four seven ends go like so the four seven ends go here just simply turn them over and bend them a little bit so they don't fall out when you're soldering them. Put them all in place and it's hit. Okay, again we've cleaned the tip. It's up to temperature. That's just a simple matter of doing a bit more soldering. Try not to get them too hot. Again, if you come across ones like this, don't solder them in because you might accidentally fill that hole in. Just leave it for now. And when you have finished soldering, it's a good idea to just snip the ends off like that. Just makes it easier to solder the rest on. Now separate one group from the rest like these 1k resistors they can go there's a 1k there doesn't matter which way they go in just put them all in keep them all separate so you don't lose track of what you're doing check all the ICs are in the sockets correctly and that the white caps are all in the right places look at the blue line top right those two parts are in the wrong spot everything else is correct some of the parts may be different in some way to the ones you have but the important numbers and letters on the parts and the board are the same and can be matched to the board in exactly the same way the large black capacitors negative pin is the shorter one and the round transistor is easy to put in the wrong way so take particular care to put them in right the filters are a little tricky also, but the directions are well stated on the board. Now, the parts are in fact quite hardy and can take some heat, but the transistors are somewhat heat sensitive, so do not use more than medium heat setting on the soldering iron and be sure to remove the iron straight after the solder flows onto the pins. You could use mini crock clips 
on the pins on the other side of the board to absorb some of the heat if you're concerned about this. Take a look at the rear of the circuit board. Always ensure that the parts are in correctly and in the right holes and never allow the solder to join other parts that are not joined by the circuit board. If you can see solder joins that are connected by the light red line that's okay but if they are not do not solder them together. If you do and you power it up the whole board will fail. Now look at the lower right hand side of the board. You will notice that the audio and the positive and negative terminals are close together. You have to be absolutely certain that these are not confused with. Hence the reason I use different coloured wires here. They are also easily broken off at the board so soldering a small pin in the holes will make for a stronger connection. But I used hot melt glue after soldering them in for convenience and to ensure that they don't short circuit and will damage the performance of the detector. The small round black speaker supplied in this kit is okay for testing the board if you connect it the right way round but the audio on this board works exceptionally well and easily drives a set of headphones. You can test the polarity of the audio on the headphones just as long as you don't short the two out directly with solder for example. The detector doesn't seem to mind not being connected while there is still power for a very short period of time. Now look at the top right hand side of the board called threshold. Those three are connected to the trim pot which is used to adjust the point at which the sound of the detector can be just heard as background. Mainly so we can be sure that the detector circuit is working correctly. The bottom left hand side is connected to the coil. Never short these out directly. Always ensure you have a good coil connected before applying power to the circuit. Now once you have connected the coil, the trim pot, speaker and the battery power, the circuit should fire up and possibly emit a sound through the speaker. If not, disconnect the power and check everything. Then check everything again. Sleep on the problem and maybe the answer will come to you in the morning. If not, you may have made a mistake and the best recourse is to start again and learn from your mistakes. Like I said before, I can't fault find and the technical help I once had is now not available. If it does emit a sound, congratulations. Look at the picture with the wires attached. All you have to do now is set the delay pots. They're the blue pots. The blue circle has a part missing and you can see I have hot melt glue the parts together to stop them from touching which is not necessarily a good idea because it is now more difficult to repair if something is wrong. Those two blue delay pots in the red circles need to be set right. Turn off the television and ensure that there are no metal objects nearby. Get a very small flat screwdriver and carefully turn the bottom brass screw counterclockwise one turn. If the sound did not increase then keep turning until say five more turns. Do the same to the top brass screw. These are 20 turn pots and we want to ensure that we start adjusting them from the off position. Also check that I have got the direction right. Now starting with the bottom blue pot turn the brass screw clockwise until you hear a beep. That is the point at which the thread starts the adjustment to the delay. Then just keep turning full half turns till the noise gets louder which every turn. As soon as you notice that the turns are not changing greatly, stop and then do the same to the top pot. You will find that the detector will be very sensitive at this point and there is no real need to do any other adjustments. 
You will also find that the detector will work better outside, where there are no or very little interferences. Congratulations, your detector is now ready to use.